horticulturist and nursery professional, and he graduated in 70 with a BS in horticultural sciences from a &M. He also had performed graduate studies at the University of Arkansas in horticultural studies, so he knows what he's talking about. He's president and founder of J. Berry Nursery in Great Saline, and he's previously uh, worked with multiple nurseries serving as production and propagation and general managers at various nursery and plant development companies, so he's got quite a career in this industry. He served in Texas, Georgia, and Atlanta and other places, and he continues to influence the horticulture industry around the world. And then in 2005, he founded J. Berry Nursery, of which he is president and founder, like I said. He's held various industry leadership positions in his field in organizations such as Horticultural Research Institute, Southern Nursery Association of Atlanta, Georgia, the USDA Wood Germplasm, I was an MIS major, sorry. Friends of the National Arboretum in Washington, D.C., and the North Texas Growers Association board member, and many, many more. He's got a great CV. He and his lovely wife, Martha, have four children and six grandchildren, and his two sons, Jonathan and Benjamin, actually work with him at the nursery. And he also has two daughters, Jessica and Fairhope in Alabama, and Charlotte and Carrington, Texas. Please welcome Jim Berry, class of 70. Impressed. <laughs> well, on this Texas Independence Day, you can't help but think about the, the bravery and Goliath at the Alamo and ultimately San Jacinto. What a determination those guys had, with the support, I'm sure, of a lot of women, to be free. Today we remember men and women that were determined to, that had that same spirit of serving themselves, but more importantly, serving others. It's an honor to be your speaker tonight. I grew up in Granbury. Do you know where that is? Yeah. Yep. On the Brazos River, just north of town, it's now like Granbury. And I miss the palm trees and the sandy beaches. Our values were instilled by our parents and by our community and our church. We were expected to uh, give our best effort, seek an education, take initiative, and be accountable to family and community. And I guess by nature we were competitive, the Berry family. But <clears throat> thinking about uh, my childhood got me to thinking about early Texans. Everyone has a story about how they got here. Well, I think the Berry family started in the mid-1800s a group of cousins and brothers moved their family from the Tidewater area of Virginia to what was then, I think, Johnson County. And Johnson County eventually broke up into Hood, Somerville, and Johnson. But if you Google Berry Knob, that will cite where my family settled. It's uh, below the lake in Granbury. And they moved to Texas, I like to think, to move away from maybe an oppressive civil situation that morally they could not agree with. I don't know that for a fact, but it was prior to the Civil War. But they were determined to become, to become Texans and to become, become cattlemen. Of course, uh, Johnson County has beautiful rolling prairie, and family stories said that the, the, the native grasses were so tall that the horses had trouble wading through them. And family stories have it that Indians would run by, fortunately non-threatening, but that was in the shadows of Comanche Peak. <clears throat> My 
grandpa's <clears throat> story was not easy. He came from a very large supportive family and he was the first son, first child expected by my great grandfather James Beery. By the way, I'm named after multiple generations of grandfathers on both sides. They were either named Jim or James. So, uh, <clears throat> but Grandpa Barry's father, while his mother was pregnant, went to West Texas to investigate the opportunities that might be in further West Texas, specifically Iran. <laughs> On that business trip, he contracted smallpox in El Paso and came back to Central Texas, died in isolation, buried in isolation, leaving a widow with my grand's grandfather. <clears throat> Things weren't always easy. Can you imagine what the early Texan settlers, settlers faced? Uh, a big country, uh, Indians, drought, hail, isolation, they faced a lot. So my great-grandmother proceeded to have a whole series of step of, of husbands. There were some scalawags, there were some good men, not all of them were very nice to my grandfather. In fact, one of them prohibited him, prohibited him from having a gun, but he made his own gun and eventually chased the man off. <laughs> and my the, the, the stepfather came to my his mother and said, Did you hear what Arthur said to me? He said, Yes, I did, and I suspect you better listen to him. <laughs> he was long gone. <laughs> Grandpa Barry went on to study at Adran Christian College, uh, the forerunner of TCU. He was more of an intellect and not much of a farmer. He taught school, he was taught, taught himself to be an attorney, to defend himself against being accused of shooting somebody's cow. And he won the case. So, uh, his life wasn't easy, but he made the most of it. Typical of so many early Texans. Married the love of his life uh, when she was a student at, uh, they were students, and Beulah Garner, and modern recent information tells me that uh, the Garners weren't black nuts, that that was really a code for Indian. There were some Indians that did not want to go to the reservations and they wanted to be uh, perceived as being more Caucasian. And that explains why family photo shows all my great uncles and great grandmother and great grandmother garners were very dark skinned, dark haired people. Arthur and Beulah had seven children and she died in childbirth. And my father was one of the surviving children. My mother had a, was part of a migration, probably around 1920, from the Ozark Mountains to Texas. The community of Waples, Texas, outside of Granbury was settled by very uh, very family familiar names like the Shannons, the Grays, the Webbs, and Masseys and others. I visited Blue Mountain Cemetery where they that community pretty much moved in mass. <coughs> there were the very familiar names. She traveled three weeks with her siblings and on a wagon from Arkansas to Texas. Why they moved, I never knew. Initially, they picked cotton. 
My Aunt Anna Mae, her sister, eventually had the last breakfast with John F. Kennedy and then subsequently flew on Air Force One with President Nixon. Now, is that not an amazing jump for one person to, to have made? Uh, my uncle, who was also part of the migrant migration, had risen to pretty high levels in state government. And that entitled him to move in such circles. But I grew up working hard in field, fields. Mom and Dad had nine children. Uh, I've already told you what we were expected to, to be. We were instructed to be berries at standards, expectations, responsibilities. <coughs> you know, eventually uh, people of the same cloth came together to, to, to establish Texas a &M. The same values. Uh, people that had more to give looking for an opportunity to, to serve the community, to better themselves, to better mankind. Uh, in Granbury, one day my cousin called me. I was probably about Josh's age. He said, you want to go to the drive-in movie tonight? I said, what's showing? He said, Gone with the Wind. The Brasses Theater is still going on. It's one of the few drive-ins in the nation. So I said, that sounds like fun. So he lived with our aunt, both Ethel Boyd, by the way. So uh, Aunt Ethel had ordered, asked that uh, Theron bring some toilet paper back, back to the house. So we did a lot of shopping at the little north side grocery. Mr. and Mrs. Carswell owned it, so we stopped there. And we thought, well, if we buy some Cokes, candy, gum, we won't have to go to the concession stand. So we had Coke, candy, gum, toilet paper. <laughs> and I said, Miss Carswell, we thought we'd stop here. We're on our way to the drive-in. We won't have to go to the concession stand now. <laughs> she just died like that. As we were leaving the parking lot, I realized what picture I had painted. <laughs> I'm sure she told that story and laughed about it until the day she died, hopefully not using my name. She passed away last month at 102 years old. That's just amazing. But uh, my dad was brought up, uh, even though he dropped out of school, at, at, in the seventh grade because of his eyesight, uh, measles related, related eye degeneration. And like I said, my grandfather wasn't much of a farmer, but dad had a passion for agriculture. And mama, he and mom had nine children. So I was the eighth farm hand to come along. But Texas A&M has meant a lot to our family. It was uh, a support for the values that we had as a family. From the faculty to the student body, to the code of honor, to the total spirit of cooperation and respect that we had for one another. There's a lineage from the early Texas settlers that needed their neighbors. And they spoke howdy when they saw that neighbor coming down the road. I've uh, met some nice friends from Australia, from the outback. And they're very similar to Texans. I think it's because they moved to a real harsh environment and they had the same experiences that we've had. They're very friendly folks. 
but Americans in general are put on a higher level because we had the courage to, to become independent. But they relate to Texans very, were very similar. <clears throat> so Texas A&M to me has, was an environment that developed my critical thinking. I wasn't taught, well, I was taught more than what was in the book, but I was challenged to find, figure out things that weren't in the book. And that was a preparation for Aggies for many, many years to feed the hungry, to fuel, to energize the world, to go out into their fields of medicine and science and move mankind forward. Tonight, we're missing some of those individuals that did exactly that, who were prepared to, 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 to serve others, to serve the community in a respectful way. What, even though they're physically not here, their legacy endures, and we're very thankful for the contributions that those that are missing, they are, as we will be, and as many Aggies have been in the past, the spirit of Aggieland has been strengthened by their presence. And we miss them, but we will not forget them. Uh, I was in California last week and at a hotel bar uh, getting, grabbing a bite to eat. There was a couple there from uh, Ohio that were both Buckeyes. <clears throat> of course, Johnny Mansell is now in Ohio, so his name came up. And I really was glad that they're, they're sticking by him. To send, you know, the guy's got a chance. We're, we're behind him. So I enjoyed telling them about meeting uh, his father at Rodney's crack, crab Shack one night over in Big Sandy. And I said, well, he may be a punk, but he was our punk. <laughs> <laughs> now he's your punk. We wish him well. But the gentleman had spent some time with some firm in Houston. He found out I was an Aggie, and he said, you know, there were a lot of Aggies in that firm. He said, they had the most positive, take charge, can-do attitude, leadership. So that made me proud. I was. A few days later in Southern California visiting a, a very large nursery. The gentleman had lived in Texas for 10 years and then had professionally moved to California. But he left a son behind and had just gotten out of A&M with civil engineering degree and had been accepted at Stanford for a master's. And he just couldn't say enough about the greatness of our university and how he always comes back, he, he makes it back for the Yale practices and as many games as he can. The guy has been penetrated and infected with what we take for granted. And he was very, very pleasing to me. So I don't want to uh, detract from the reason that we're here tonight, and that is to remember and honor the contributions of those that are missing, but have strengthened us through the spirit of Aggie Land. Thank you.
the mustard tradition. Century old roots provide the basis for Texas A&M's mustard as we know it today. It has changed, yet the spirit in which it was established remains the same. Since the founding of Texas A&M, every Aggie has lived and become a part of the Aggie spirit. What we feel today is not just the camaraderie of fellow Aggies, it's the spirit of hundreds of thousands of Aggies who've gone before us and who will come after us. Muster is how that spirit is remembered and celebrated. And it will always continue to unite Texas A&M and the Aggie family. A&M may change, but the spirit never will. In the beginning, Aggies gathered on June 26, 1883, to live over again their college days, the victories and defeats won and lost upon the drill field and in the classroom. By April 21, 1903, this annual gathering evolved into a celebration of Texas independence on Texas San Jacinto Day. These early meetings included field games, banquets for Aggies to reflect and celebrate their memories of Aggieland. Let every alumni answer a roll call, wrote former students. It was not until 1922, however, that April 21 became the official day of the events for all Aggies. Thus, the annual tradition of muster was born. The March 1923 Texas Aggie urged, if there's an A&M man, one in a hundred miles of you, you're expected to gather, eat a little, live over the days you spent at Texas A&M College of Texas. Still remembering and honoring the time spent in Aggieland, the tradition of muster has grown in strength and meaning and in spirit. By 1929, the meeting had spread worldwide and in 1942, the Aggie muster gained international recognition. 25 men led by General George Moore, class of 08, mustered during the Japanese siege of the Philippine Islands of Corregidor. Knowing that muster might soon be for them, these Aggies embodied the commitment, dedication, and friendship that is the essence of the Texas Aggie spirit. They risked their lives to honor their beliefs and values. That small group of Aggies on an outpost during World War II inspired what has developed into one of our greatest traditions. Today, muster is celebrated in more than 300 locations worldwide, with the largest ceremony taking place on the A&M campus and College Station. The ceremony brings together more Aggies worldwide on one occasion than any other event. In many lands and climes this April day, proud sons of Texas A&M unite. Our loyalty to country, school, we pray, and seal our pact with common bond of might. We live again those days of yore on campus, field, in classroom, dorm, and drill. Fond memories bring a sigh, but nothing more. Now we're men, and life's a greater thrill. On Career North, 73 years ago today, a band of gallant Aggies, led by Moore, held simple rites which led to us doth all, doth all we say, the spirit shall prevail through cannon roar. Before we part and go upon our way, we pause to honor those we knew so well. The old familiar faces we miss so much today left cherished recollections that time cannot elapse. Softly call the muster, let comrade answer here. Their spirits hover around us as if to bring us cheer. Mark them present in our hearts. We'll meet some other day. There is no death, but life eternal for our old friends, such as they. Thank you. <clears throat> Doug Cameron, if you'll assist me. 
We're going to have the roll call now. And to those of you that are familiar with the way that the, our, our uh, Wood and Brains County Aggie group here likes to do it, we have a candle up here. To the, one is a, a lighter candle. We'll light it originally. And all these Aggies that have, we're going to pick up these rolls, by the way. Is there one more? Anybody have one? Ah, here's a second Aggie. Okay. So those of you that have mentioned an Aggie, a fallen comrade, will definitely call muster for them. But we also have here some four special candles. And these reflect Aggies and an honorable Aggie that are all very special to us here in Wood Rains County. Two of them are locals, and one is a very, very special dear person to one of our favorites, Mr. Sadler. And finally, the fourth candle we're going to light to honor an Aggie mom. It was very, very special to the Aggie moms that got celebrated and created in Wood County, and she passed this year. So we'll light those candles, and if anyone would like to answer for those, please do. And Mr. Sadler, if you would light the candle for your mother when we call. And maybe we can have an Aggie mom, Christy, can light the candle to reflect our Aggie mom. And from there, we'll read the rest of the list as we do in our traditional roll call. And finally, I wanted to know, most of you know that I always have a candle with red, white, and blue ribbon on it to honor Aggies that have fallen, that are, um, that are, that have been killed in the line of duty. And we're pleased to announce that we have no Aggies who were killed in the line of duty since last year's muster. So we don't have the red, white, and blue candle this year. So we'll go ahead and get started on these ceremonies. Thank you. David Lee Sadler, class of seven. Here. Mrs. Beth Hedges, Aggie Mom. Here. Without her Aggie Moms, there would be no Aggies. Mr. Edward Bennett, class of 53. Here. Dr. James Humphreys, class of 51. Here. Spencer, class of 77. Here. Michael Hogue, class of 78. Here. Dr. Bob Stout, class of 55. Here. <coughs> Shelly Belsita, class of 65. Here. John W. Buckler, Sr., class of 49. Here. That concludes our muster roll call for the Marines County Agency. In memorandum, oops, in memorandum, sorry. I we stood a little taller and a little prouder then when we heard the call of muster and the roll call just begin. We stood there all together and wiped away the tears when our names were called out softly and answered with a hear. And so we've joined together with our brothers of the past to, take, to make our final resting place at Aggieland our last. We take a toast to our brotherhood wherever they may roam. For us, the trek is over. Aggieland, we're coming home. Lieutenant Colonel David Harrington, class of 68. <laughs> the 2015 Texas A&M Muster at Quitman, Texas for Wood and Rains County is now complete. 
I charge you each to remain firm in your loyalty to your country and your God, to keep warm in your hearts your affection for each other and for our alma mater. The muster is dismissed until April 21st, 2016, and may God be with us all until we meet again. Thank you all for coming. There's still plenty of food left, by the way. If we could have every day that uh, either has their acceptance letter or graduated in 1955 up here, just give you a group picture before everyone leaves. Just uh, all the Aggies up against the wall, and people will take pictures, can. Okay. Is that good? Yes, all the Aggies to take a picture. Thank you.